The Red Badge of Courage, an episode of the American Civil War by Stephen Crane. Chapter 12 The column that had butted stoutly at the obstacles in the roadway was barely out of the youth's sight before he saw dark waves of men come sweeping out of the woods and down through the fields. He knew at once that the steel fibers had been washed from their hearts. They were bursting from their coats and their equipments as from entanglements. They charged down upon him like terrified buffaloes. Behind them blue smoke curled and clouded above the treetops, and through the thickets he could sometimes see a distant pink glare. The voices of the cannon were clamoring in interminable chorus. The youth was horror-stricken. He stared in agony and amazement. He forgot that he was engaged in combating the universe. He threw aside his metal pamphlets on the philosophy of the retreated and rules of the guidance of the damned. The fight was lost. The dragons were coming with invincible strides. The army, helpless in the matted thickets and blinded by the overhanging night, was going to be swallowed. War, the red animal war, the blood-swollen god, would have bloated fill. Within him something bade to cry out. He had the impulse to make a rallying speech, to sing a battle hymn, but he could only get his tongue to call into the air. Why, why, what, what, what's the matter? Soon he was in the midst of them. They were leaping and scampering all about him. Their blanched faces shone in the dusk. They seemed, for the most part, to be very burly men. The youth turned from one to another of them as they galloped along. His incoherent questions were lost. They were heedless of his appeals. They did not seem to see him. They sometimes grabbed insanely. One huge man was asking of the sky, "'Say, where de plank road? Where de plank road?' It was as if he had lost a child. He wept in his pain and dismay. Presently men were running hither and thither in all ways. The artillery booming forward, rearward, and on the flanks made jumble of ideas of direction. Landmarks had vanished into the gathered gloom. The youth began to imagine that he had got into the center of a tremendous quarrel, and he could perceive no way out of it. From the mouths of the fleeing men came a thousand wild questions, but no one made answers. The youth, after rushing about and throwing interrogations at the heedless bands of retreating infantry, finally clutched a man by the arm. They swung around face to face. "'Why, why?' stammered the youth, struggling with his balking tongue. The man screamed, "'Let go of me! Let go of me!' His face was livid, and his eyes were rolling uncontrolled. He was heaving and panting. He still grasped his rifle, perhaps having forgotten to release his hold upon it. He tugged frantically, and the youth, being compelled to lean forward, was dragged several paces. "'Let go of me! Let go of me!' "'Why, why?' started the youth. "'Well, then,' bawled the man in a lurid rage. He adroitly and fiercely swung his rifle. It crushed upon the youth's head. The man ran on. The youth's fingers had turned to paste upon the other's arm. The energy was smitten from his muscles. He saw the flaming wings of lightning flash before his vision. There was a deafening rumble of thunder within his head. Suddenly his legs seemed to die. He sank, writhing to the ground. He tried to arise. In his efforts against the numbing pain, he was like a man wrestling with a creature of the air. There was a sinister struggle. Sometimes he would achieve a position, half erect, battle with the air for a moment, and then fall again, grabbing at the grass. His face was of the clammy pallor. Deep groans were wrenched from him. At last, with a twisting movement, he got up on his hands and knees, and from thence, like a babe trying to walk to his feet, pressing his hands to his temples, he went lurching over the grass. He fought an intense battle with his body. His dull senses wished him to swoon, and he opposed them stubbornly, his mind portraying unknown dangers and mutilations if he should fall upon the field. He went tall soldier fashion. He imagined secluded spots where he could fall and be unmolested to search for one he strove against the tide of his pain. Once he put his hand to the top of his head and timidly touched the wound. The scratching pain of the contact made him draw a long breath through his clenched teeth. His fingers were dabbed with blood. He regarded them with a fixed stare. Around him he could hear the grumble of jolted cannon as the scurrying horses were lashed toward the front. Once a young officer on a besplod charger nearly ran him down. He turned and watched the mass of guns, men, and horses sweeping in a wide curve toward a gap in the fence. The officer was making excited motions with a gauntleted hand. 
The guns followed the teams with an air of unwillingness, of being dragged by the heels. Some officers of the scattered infantry were cursing and railing like fishwives. Their scolding voices could be heard above the din. Into the unspeakable jumble in the roadway rode a squadron of cavalry. The faded yellow of their facings shone bravely. There was a mighty altercation. The artillery was assembling as if for a conference. The blue haze of evening was upon the field. The lines of forest were long purple shadows. One cloud lay along the western sky, partly smothering the red. As the youth left the scene behind him, he heard the guns suddenly roar out. He imagined them shaking in black rage. They belched and howled like brass devils guarding a gate. The soft air was filled with their tremendous remonstrance. With it came the shattering peal of opposing infantry. Turning to look behind him, he could see sheets of orange light illumine the shadowy distance. There were subtle and sudden lightnings in the far air. At times he thought he could see heaving masses of men. He hurried on in the dusk. The day had faded until he could barely distinguish place for his feet. The purple darkness was filled with men who lectured and jabbered. Sometimes he could see them gesticulating against the blue and somber sky. There seemed to be a great ruck of men and munitions spread about in the forest and in the fields. The little narrow roadway now lay lifeless. There were overturned wagons like sun-dried boulders. The bed of the former torrent was choked with the bodies of horses and splintered parts of war machines. It had come to pass that his wound pained him but little. He was afraid to move rapidly, however, for a dread of disturbing it. He held his head very still and took many precautions against stumbling. He was filled with anxiety, and his face was pinched and drawn, in anticipation of the pain of any sudden mistake of his feet in the gloom. His thoughts, as he walked, fixed intently upon his hurt. There was a cool, liquid feeling about it, and he imagined blood moving slowly down under his hair. His head seemed swollen to the size that made him think his neck to be inadequate. The new silence of his wound made much worriment. The little blistering voices of pain that had called out from his scalp were, he thought, definite in their expression of danger. By them he believed that he could measure his plight. But when they remained ominously silent, he became frightened and imagined terrible fingers that clutched into his brain. Amid it he began to reflect upon various incidents and conditions of the past. He bethought him of certain meals his mother had cooked at home in which those dishes of which he was particularly fond had occupied prominent positions. He saw the spread table. The pine walls of the kitchen were glowing in the warm light from the stove. Too, he remembered how he and his companions used to go from the schoolhouse to the bank of a shaded pool. He saw his clothes in disorderly array upon the grass of the bank. He felt the swash of the fragrant water upon his body. The leaves of the overhanging maple rustled with melody in the wind of youthful summer. He was overcome presently by a dragging weariness. His head hung forward, and his shoulders were stooped, as if he were bearing a great bundle. His feet shuffled along the ground. He held continuous arguments as to whether he should lie down and sleep at some near spot, or force himself on until he reached a certain haven. He often tried to dismiss the question but his body persisted in rebellion, and his senses nagged him like pampered babies. At last he heard a cheery voice near his shoulder. "'You seem to be in a pretty bad way, boy.' The youth did not look up, but he assented with a thick tongue. Uh. The owner of the cheery voice took him firmly by the arm. "'Well,' he said with a round laugh, "'I'm going your way. The whole gang is going your way, and I guess we can give you a lift.' They began to walk like a drunken man and his friend. As they went along, the man questioned the youth and assisted him with the replies like one manipulating the mind of a child. Sometimes he interjected anecdotes. What regiment do you belong to? Eh? What's that? The 304th New York. What corps is that in? What oh, is? Why, I thought they wasn't engaged today. They're way down or in the center. Oh, they was, eh? Well, pretty nearly everybody got their share of fighting today. By dad, I give myself up for dead many number of times. They was shooting here and hollering there and hollering here and there, hollering there and damn darkness until I couldn't tell save my soul which side I was on. Sometimes I thought I was sure enough from 
Ohio or other times, I could have swore I was from the bitter end of Florida. It was the most mixed-up darn thing I ever see, and these here hull woods is a regular mess. It'll be a miracle if we ever find our regiments tonight. Pretty soon, though, we'll meet a plenty of guards and provost guards, and one thing or another. Oh, there they go with an officer, I guess. Look at his hand a dragon. He's got all the war he wants, I bet. He won't be talking so big about his reputation, and all when they go to sawin' off his leg. Poor feller, my brother's got whiskers just like that. How did you get your way over here, anyhow? Your regiment is a long way from here, ain't it? Well, I guess we can find it. You know, there was a boy killed in my company today that I thought the world of all of. Jack was a nice feller. By ginger, it hurt like thunder to see old Jack just get knocked flat. We was a standin' pretty peaceable for a spell, though there was men runnin' every way all around us, and while we was a standin' like that, long comes a big fat feller. He began to peck at Jack's elbow and says, Say, where's the road to the river? And Jack, he never paid no attention, and that feller kept on a peckin' at his elbow and sayin', Say, where's the road to the river? Jack was looking ahead all the time, trying to see the Johnnies coming through the woods, and he never paid no attention to the big fat feller for a long time. But at last he turned around and he says, "Ah, go to hell and find the road to the river." And just then a shot slapped him bang on the side of the head. He was a sergeant too. Then was his last words, "Thunder! I wish we was sure of finding our regiments tonight. It's going to be a long hunting, but I guess we can do it." In the search which followed, the man of the cheery voice seemed to the youth to possess a wand of a magic kind. He threaded the mazes of the tangled forest with a strange fortune. In encounters with guards and patrols he displayed the keenness of a detective and the valor of a gamin. Obstacles fell before him and became of assistance. The youth, with his chin still on his breast, stood woodenly by while his companion beat ways and means out of sullen things. The forest seemed a vast hive of men buzzing about in frantic circles, but the cheery man conducted the youth without mistakes until at last he began to chuckle with glee and self-satisfaction. Ah, uh, there you are. See that fire? The youth nodded stupidly. Well, there's where your regiment is. And now, good-bye, old boy. Good luck to you. A warm and strong hand clasped the youth's languid fingers for an instant, and then he heard a cheerful and audacious whistling as the man strode away as he who had so befriended him was thus passing out of his life it suddenly occurred to the youth that he had not once seen his face End of chapter twelve